Welcome live to uh, Reverend Tom Phillips' porch. Ta-da! Ta-da! This is a good day. Let's hope so. It's yeah. a day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it, even though our youth, events, our youth event was canceled and then the power was canceled at Canterbury, so we have no power at my house. <laughs> even. Which is why we're at my house. So, yeah, so, just in case anyone was wondering what my back porch looks like, here it is. Yep. And I've got my daughter here helping out with the sound technician. Here, come on and say hello to her. Hi. No, I, I don't want soon. to. Come on. <laughs> just wave to everybody. Wave. Just say hello. There you go. Hi. Right off. Very good. <clears throat> So this is our annual youth event that we have. This is kind of Q&A. Annual. Annual. annual means once a year. We do this more than Actually, once this a is year. our annual Q&A. Annual. Does God exist? Oh, wow. I didn't realize we had one of those either. Yeah, we do. We do now. This is an annual Yeah, this event. is our annual Q&A, Does God Exist, where... Have you... Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Have yeah. you put that on the schedule for next year? I am working on my schedule. Did you hear what he said? He said he's working on it. I'm working on it. What does that it. mean? I'm very That's unplanned. a nice diplomatic way to say no. This Lent, I'm, I'm trying to repent and look at my calendar daily. Doesn't and, seem uh, to be working. It's not working. Daddy, <laughs> someone just said you have nice sandals. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Perez. They're Chacos. Eric Perez. Hey, Eric. Eric Perez. What's up, man? Thank you, Eric. These are brand new. Just the same pattern as my old ones. Yep. Eric Perez, everyone. <clears throat> He's like a youth pastor, a helper. Yeah. He does everything. Yeah. Eric does everything. He was the youth so. guide incarnation for a long, long yeah. time. So when I first started working with the students, I'm like, I know Eric. I'm cool, too. I had legit did that. Legit did that. So. Can you see who's online? I can't. Um, I have phone batteries dying. I'm a bit of a boomer right now, so let's check it out. So we're also on Instagram Live, and uh, this will also be posted on YouTube. So if there's any parents out there or anyone uh, who want to send it out to your youth or your kids, wherever you are, this will also be on our YouTube page and on Facebook Live. So, yes. We've got to scoot over there, but we need six feet. Oh, wait. Uh-oh. I think we're good. Cool, cool. All right, Tom, tell us a story about you at youth group. You were a PK. I never had a youth group. What? Up. That's sad. No. Nope. Well, tell us a story about how sad <clears throat> Well, quick. If you're just tuning in, here's what we're doing. We're going to give this a few minutes for people to jump online. But our goal tonight is to do your Bible questions and our Bible answers. We're not experts. I'm not, I'm not a Bible scholar. Don't claim to be. But I do know some stuff, and I'll be happy to tell you when I don't know. But uh, we want you all to feel free to ask your questions about God, about who He is, um, about your life, your world, and we'll do our best to answer them using what we know about the Word, the Scripture, the Bible, and uh, the character and nature of God. So yes. that's what we're here to do. We'll start in just a minute. Um, you're asking me to tell yeah. youth group stories? Okay, look, Yeah. I never had a youth group growing up. Um, <laughs> our churches were small. My dad was a pastor, too. I don't ever remember having a church that had a youth group. I know some churches that we were in, my brother and I, and I have a twin brother, we were the only kids in the church, which makes it tough to have a youth group with your twin brother. Yeah. So um, I remember when, <laughs> when I first got serious about following Jesus, I was 17. I had an encounter with God at a summer camp, Camp Lourdes, changed my life, um, came back to Charlotte where I lived after that experience and um, started looking for Christian friends. And I had a good friend at the time, his name was Matt Pearson, and he invited me to a church in Charlotte, I can't remember the name of it, um, for a Super Bowl party. And it was somewhat of a youth event. And I went to that, and I remember joking with him years later. I said, hey Matt, thanks for never sharing the gospel with me when I really needed to hear it. Oh. <laughs> oh. We laughed. He's uh, I was his best man at his wedding. We're good friends now, and he is um, in Salt Lake City. He's a doctor, loves Jesus, got a great family. But uh, I think the only youth event I ever went to as a high school student was that one, a one football Super Bowl party um, where Matt 
half-heartedly tried to invite me to his youth group. You got to give him some credit. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. I got a bug. <clears throat> that is amazing. Can you see who's online? Yes. We got uh, got the Andres. Yeah. Yep. Lauren and Blake are here. Wait. Eric Perez. We got Wade. Wade. Wade Griggs. Wade. Griggs. Wade, you're not in our youth group. Yeah. Wade, <laughs> Sorry, buddy. You're the best. There's a cutoff at uh, 42, and I'm getting real close to it. Yeah. You are way, way over it. <laughs> Wade, I miss you. Hope your shoulder's doing good. Yeah. Uh, I miss you too, Wade. Yeah. Just and kidding. we got hang a, out, Wade. And You're we got welcome. Anissa, Nyasha, really, Nikki. Uh, yes. They're all on Instagram Live because Instagram's on. cool. Do you have an Instagram, Tom? That's a negative. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. That's a negator, Skeletor. It's okay. So, um, I got this cool hat though. That is a cool Look. hat. It matches incarnation colors. See that? So it's trendy. <laughs> it's trendy hat. Um. Anyway, students, you can put your. Uh, if you have any questions, we do have a list of questions. If y'all are like, uh, like I don't know if I want to ask that question, you can ask it anonymously you can ask it in the comment section um, or we have a list of questions too kind of those big questions that we all kind of ask in our minds so and let me say this yes. um, Seth wanted this to be an impromptu event so he is not giving me these questions ahead of time and for that I am angry and frustrated it's, it's, rightly I'm so I'm just kidding uh, <laughs> but we haven't put any thought into this uh, we're gonna do our best to answer these questions faithfully um, as they come to us so yes. these are not these are not questions for which we've studied you can tune us out now after I've said that yeah. <clears throat> oh, there we are wow. look at that that's happening right now man <laughs> look I'm waving at myself we're so old right now <laughs> we are not cool we are not cool <laughs> All right. Let's do it, man. So, okay. Any students have any questions, or we have a warm-up question? Um, a warm-up question. Yeah. The only question we've got so far is Eric asked if you have a twin, and you do. Yeah, I do, Eric, and his name is John Phillips, but you'll find him online under John Lindsay, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y. He's quite a famous musician. He's traveled all over the world playing with big yes. bands. Um, he's, he's made a lot of money doing that, and that's what he does. He is unbelievably talented. If you look up John Lindsay, J-O-N-L-I-N-D-S-A-Y, you're going to see him and a bodybuilder. Don't confuse the two. Yeah. The one that looks like me is my brother, and neither one of us look like a bodybuilder. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh, it's very true. <laughs> so sad. Uh, and the Hey Goods are here. <clears throat> wow. So we got, we got What's up, Hey Goods? We got, the, we got the crew. A lot of the crew. Great. So, so okay. let's do some Bible. So, all right. Well, <coughs> since it doesn't look like we have too many... Uh, um, questions in yet I do have one of those hard questions that I gave Tom uh, not entirely advanced but it says does science explain everything Tom yeah uh, that's a great question and you know um, it I know that we've got people listening who are interested in this question because I know um, I've had this conversation with a couple folks in our church uh, no the answer is you, wait, ask the question again. Does this. science explain everything? Does science explain everything? Yeah. Like, does God, if, if God exists, you know, like, just think of, does God exist? Well, if God doesn't exist, does science explain everything? Or, oh, I mean, phrase it however you want. Okay, does science explain it? Yeah. Um, okay, here's the thing. We worship a God who is the creator God of the universe. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, um, we shouldn't be afraid of discovering his nature and character. Dang, there's a bug. Through, through science. I think sometimes we polarize things where we say, okay, you've either got to believe that there's a God and that he created everything, or you're going to be scientific about it and you're going to look after facts. Um, as if those things are polar opposites, and I just don't think they are at all. Um, I think there's plenty of... Daggummit, this bug. Do you want some <laughs> bug spray? <laughs> no, we're good. Are there's plenty sure? of reasons to um, take science unbelievably seriously and to do so with faith and to say, you know what, God, if you really are real... If you really are creator, um, if you really have made this world in which we see, if the physics that we study in high school are your physics, if the mathematics that we've discovered as, human as humanity are your mathematics, then we shouldn't be afraid to open our eyes and look seriously at the scientific world and do it with the understanding that we're going to find you at the end of it. Um, 
and interestingly, this, you know, in, in many regards, the scientific revolution, um, which some people would say led us away from God, um, was started by scientists who very much believed in God. Um, the Western Europe, at the beginning of the, science, uh, of the age of science, was a very Christian place. And a lot of these people who led us into all sorts of scientific discoveries were faithful people who were not at all trying to disprove um, God's existence. And I don't think we need to do that whatsoever. I'll say, um, I got a science degree. Did yeah. you know that? Um, Actually, you did get a science degree. I did. My undergraduate degree was in geology. And he was valedictorian, by the way, at his school. I like was. I was the number one of the worst school in the state system of North Carolina. Yep, North Carolina. Best of the worst. Um, but I studied geology, which is rocks, rocks for jocks. Yep. And um, I can tell you that all throughout my four years in school, um, I had a lot of science, a lot of my science professors, my geology professors say this, and I, I'm, this happened over and over again. They would say, you know what, it is unbelievable the way this world works. And if it didn't work just like this, the whole world would unravel and we can't explain why. For instance, I can remember an example when this happened in class. We were talking about water and the density of water relative to temperature. One of the things we know about liquids is, in general, the colder those liquids get, the more dense they get. That's why when you swim in a lake, the cold water is towards the bottom of the lake. Um, it's colder, so it's denser. So it sinks to the bottom of the lake. And water is follows that rule. The colder it gets, the denser it gets. But it departs drastically from most other liquids in that when water gets about 2 degrees Celsius, it actually gets less dense, less dense at 1 degree, less dense at 0.5 degrees, until finally when it freezes, it floats. This is the, why, this is the reason ice floats, because... As it cools to the near freezing point, it actually gets less dense, which brings it up in the water column where it can contact the air and float. And I had one of my science professors, who I don't think was a Christian by any means, literally throw up his hands and say, I got no explanation for this, but I can tell you right now that if water didn't behave this way, the world would unravel as we know it. And I just thought, wow. dang. <laughs> yes. We have a question from Tommy Haygood. Can you tell us about a time you witnessed God's presence? Yeah. Yes. Are we talking science still or just any yeah. time? You, it can be science. I mean, you could even wrap it into how you experienced God's presence maybe in school when you were getting your degree. <clears throat> I mean, no, I'm going to, okay, I'll t okay yeah. Tommy, I'm going to break from science. Um, but I got a lot more to say about that, and I, I got a lot more to say about it, particularly geologically, because I'll say this. Um, let me let me round off the comment I was making about uh, science and God. Um, I think a lot of times you will hear this kind of stuff in school. Um, oh, the Earth is millions of years old, and and uh, science clearly proves that, for instance, the strata layers of sediment that were laid down in the west western part of the U.S., like the Grand Canyon, were laid down over millions of years. And I think once you get an advanced degree and you really get into the weeds of um, geosciences and particularly you realize that a lot of what we learn in junior high and high school that we're told is just straight up fact is actually theory. Um, and there are even a lot of scientists that question all sorts of things that we're told in junior high and high school that are just straight up fact. Um, that really is true. Uh, I'm not saying that the world is 6,000 years old. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just simply saying um, that things are a bit more complicated than we may learn in high school. Yeah. Uh, okay. Time when I saw God. Yeah. You he know, all right, I've, I've said this a lot to different people. If you had to say to me, Tom, prove to me that God exists and don't use the Bible, I would use my wallet. Cool. I would use my wallet. Hmm. And I think that's probably an important thing for people to hear right now as we're a week into a national health emergency people are losing jobs people are getting pay cuts people are getting laid off losing hours listen um, for 12 years Julia and I raised support as missionaries when we ran a Bible school we never got paid a single salary not a single day and we never lacked for anything one of the major reasons I know God is real, and one of the major ways I've seen him 
pull through and prove his reality in my life over and over again is financial provision. And I got a gajillion stories. I'll just share you one that's kind of cute and cool. Um, when I was 21, just wading into this um, as a young adult, I was with the youth, youth of the Mission, a missions organization. And we were in Seattle, Washington, which is near your hometown, yep. right? We were actually in Tacoma. You know where that is? Oh, yeah. And yep. man, Tacoma is awesome because you can literally look behind the city and you can see Mount Rainier. Rainier. It looks like it's going to fall on you. Unless it's in the clouds. It's 14,000 feet above the city and it is just so impressive. Yeah. I mean, you can't get away from it. It's everywhere. So we were doing ministry in the city for a week and I was flat broke. I mean, I'm talking, I had no money. Couldn't go to the magic wall and put the plastic in and get some money out. Uh, I was just done. And everybody on my outreach team was going to go out that night because there was this cool thing that had just started happening in the world called Starbucks. Anybody know anything about that? Ooh. Yeah. But back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth um, in the year 2000, uh, when I was with Youth with a Mission, it was 20 years ago. Can you believe that? Dang. Um, Starbucks was like brand new. And so they were like, hey, we're going to go spend $6 on a coffee. It's ridiculous, but we're going to do it. And I thought, man, I can't go. I don't have any money. And so I didn't say anything to anyone else. I said this. I said, God, I really want to go to Starbucks tonight. Would you please give me $10 so that I can go to Starbucks tonight? And so I just prayed that. And I said, I'm just going to go. And so we're walking down the street of Seattle, Washington, or Tacoma, Washington, and we're on our way to Starbucks. And this has never happened to me before or since. I'm walking across an intersection and I look down and right on the curb is a crisp $10 bill. And I picked it up and I winked at God and I put it in my pocket. Uh, it's a completely true story. And I got a bunch of them. I mean, I just have time after time after time where myself as a single person and then as a married person with Julia have seen God's provision in our life financially in unexplainable ways. And let me tell you what it's done. It has increased my faith and just unlocked radical generosity in our life. I mean, radical generosity. Um, Julia and I give, we give enough to scare me. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Um, it's crazy unless there's a God who really does know our every need and whom we can never outgive. And I firmly believe that. You cannot outgive God. Give it a shot. It's impossible. In fact, Malachi tells us that. Malachi 3, test me on this, says the Lord, and see if your storehouses don't overflow with provision. I've seen that over and over. Yeah. So that's the answer to that one. That's amazing. Yeah. Good question. Hey, good. Thank you. Thank good you. Good question. So, all right. We'll keep waiting. I need to see if I'm getting Melanie Williams questions. said, Amen. Good job, Melanie. That's what I'm talking about. Um, you want to hear another one? Can I tell you another financial miracle? Yes. All right. So when we started Emmaus, the Bible school, 2006, Julia That's why I, I moved down to Florida, by the way. Yep. Julia and I felt very impressed by God that we were not to ask anyone for money because Julia's plan was to work full time. And so we were not going to raise financial support that first year. Um, Julia was going to get a job in, in the local community. Well, we moved to Lake Lure in June of 2006, and Julia did not have a job. And we had about $1,000 in our bank account, which might Ooh. sound a lot like a lot if you're watching this and you're 12, but it ain't a lot when you're grown up and you got to pay bills. That's yeah. less than a month's worth of rent, even. Like, we were broke. We had nothing. And Julia was interviewing, but nothing had come through yet. <clears throat> so we're just praying, God, we really need your provision in our lives. We really need to see you come through because we haven't asked anyone for money and we're not going to. Well, I'm at the storage unit, getting our stuff out of storage, moving into an apartment that we were renting in Lake Lure. And there's this guy from New Jersey pulls up next to me. He's got a great kind of like gangster New Jersey accent. And he's talking under his breath, and I just started a conversation with him. So what's going on? He's like, ah, I'm moving. I can't find anybody to paint my house for under a thousand, or he said under two thousand dollars. Mm. <coughs> like the red flags are going off in my head. I'm like, listen, bro, I'm gonna guarantee you one thing. I'll change the color of your house for less than two thousand dollars. <laughs> and he's like, really? When can you start? I said, I can start right today. And the very next day. Me and Julia were over at his house. We painted his entire house outside. We did such a good job outside that he asked us to paint inside as well. And he gave us $3,500 and, no yes, and a vacuum cleaner that we still have in our garage right now today. 
16 years later, we're still using that vacuum cleaner. Yeah. And it is just a sign of the provision and blessing of the Lord. Um, yeah. God pulled through. That 3500 bucks got us through the month that we needed to get through until Julia got a great job. And uh, we've just seen God do it. We've seen him do it over and over and over again. Yeah. And I, I don't know. Am I allowed to talk on this Q&A? <laughs> kind of interviewed the cool guy. But actually, I do have pain on my hands. So I am super thankful as we speak. Uh, I used to live in the mountains, kind of do more maintenance, yard stuff. And even God's kind of provided painting for us. Because uh, as we're doing renovations at Canterbury, and we groups are obviously not coming to Canterbury, it's kind of been cool watching God move us all in different areas, you know, and hopefully you guys Hold will see God thought. move even more in this time. I'm going to go get yes. a prop and you're not going to want to miss this story. Please hang in here. I'm going to be back going to my garage for 30 seconds. I'll be right back. <laughs> He's excited. <laughs> all right. Should I so, get a chicken? Um, can she get a chicken, Tom? Dad, one of the tiny ones. I'm going to do it. I'm going to hey. do it. No, youth events can be fun. I've been told I haven't been fun enough. I'm sorry, youth. Actually, my youth trainer said I need to have more fun with you, so I say yes to the chicken. And, um, yeah. Chickens are good. <laughs> Tommy Haygood still watching? Uh, yeah, I hope. Well, we'll see. I'm anyway. sure Tommy's still watching. All right, we got a bunch of Floridians on this feed, but does anyone know what this is? This is thing, and we don't do much with this here in Florida. No. This is a snowboard. Yeah. <laughs> it's something you use in a place where there's this stuff called snow. It falls from the sky and you ski on it. Anyway, this is not just any snowboard. This is my old Burton wood core snowboard that I used to use when I was in college. Oh wow, look, there's a chicken. Thank you. We have chickens too. All right, Tommy, you're asking, how do I know God is real? It's stuff like this, man. I wanna share this story too. This is so encouraging. When I was 21, um, I was out in Montana. I was studying the Bible, which is uh, the same. I was doing the same program that I started uh, five years later um, with Emmaus Ministries. And I was distracted by skiing. I just wanted to ski every single day. And it was a mess. It was ruining my study life. And I knew that I had to put it down. In fact, I felt God saying to me this, Tom, you need to try. You got a chicken. Wow. I know. He, isn't he cute? Yeah, this until is, he poops on the couch. This is Narnar. -nar. <laughs> he was right. narcoleptic when he was a baby. That's true. Yeah. Well, it's because we had the light on all night, the heat light. <laughs> we had to take that out. He couldn't fall asleep. He was <laughs> killing the thing <laughs> day after day. He anyway. was fine. He's perfect now. He's, he's keep attention, Tom. <laughs> all right, snowboard story. So, um, so I felt like God said this to me. Tom, I need you to trust me, and I want you to put snowboarding away. In fact, I felt like he said, Tom, I want you to give away your snowboard. And so I did. I gave away my snowboard. I gave away my boots. I spent the rest of that winter studying and I didn't snowboard at all. The next year, I'm still living in Montana. It's October and the snow is starting to fall and I don't have a snowboard and I don't have any money to get a snowboard. And I'm praying. In fact, I'm writing in my journals. God, why did you ask me to give my snowboard away? I really want a snowboard. I'm praying into this. And I felt like God said, Tom, trust me, I'm going to give you a snowboard. And when I felt like he said that to me, you know what I said back to him? It's a completely true story. I said, all right, God, if you're going to give me a snowboard, I want a blue Burton snowboard. Oh, <laughs> True, I really oh, said that. Nice now listen, God's not a genie in the bottle. You don't rub him and get your three wishes. He's not there to make your dreams come true. But he did it for me this time, and he did it to increase my faith, and I've never forgot it. Here's what happened. A few weeks later, a guy came up to me from church. I didn't know this guy. We were friends, but we, went, we didn't hang out. And he said, hey, Tom, you like to ski and snowboard, don't you? I said, yep. He said, look, man, I got a snowboard in my house that I've never used. It's brand new. He said, I want to give it to you. Will you come over to my house after church? I'm going to give you that snowboard. And it's a completely true story. I'll never forget it. I pulled into his driveway. And I saw the garage door opening. He hit the button and it's opening. And right inside his garage, by the door going into his house, was this snowboard. A blue Burton snowboard, 60 centimeters, perfect size for me. He handed it to me brand new. And God winks and says, bro, you can trust me. I know what you like. I know what you love. I created those loves and desires in you. And I'm going to meet them in my time 
my way. You put it down when I say put it down. I'll put it, I'll give it back to you. When I give it back to you, you can trust me. Yeah. So that's it. The snowboard's ruined, the bindings are all gone and cracked, but I will never lose it. I keep it around to remember God's faithfulness. Yeah. Probably never ski on it again. Although it's still still got a decent back. Yeah. And good question, and also that God's presence question is from Caitlin. Hagen. I was just gonna say, so, Caitlin sweet. has joined Cruising us. Caitlin. Caitlin. So great question, good, Caitlin. Very good. And also, Lauren painted today. We're getting some live updates. Painted. Yeah, she also nice. painted today. So, anyway, a bigger question. So, this is actually a question uh, thread online, but it's hard. So, um, well, it's a very complicated question. So, I don't even necessarily know, but I would say, it says, isn't the chaos in the world? A sign of God's absence so all this chaos uh, this COVID-19 I'm losing school I mean mosquitoes are biting you uh, the chaos in the world is that a sign of God being absent yeah ah, it's a great question um, I think it's a good question I think it's a legitimate question here's why um, most of the time when people tell me their stories of what caused them to drift away from God it's usually hardship. It's usually heartache. It usually goes back to a moment of disappointment, missed expectations, suffering, sickness, unmet realities, some kind of unforeseen circumstance that threw someone for a loop and they came to this determination. You know what? If God was real, if God cared, this never would have happened. So I'm done with him. Um, that is a place that a lot of people get to. And I think it comes from a misunderstanding of exactly the question you're asking. Look, um, this really is the reality of it. Uh, sin, suffering, sickness, death, disease, chaos, turmoil, those are not things that were part of the original world that God created. You ever go back and read Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. He created a perfect world, no sin, no suffering, no sickness, no death, and he put humankind, man and woman, yep. in that place with him and said, you exist for a relationship with me, I exist for a relationship with you, and we're going to do it here, but we're going to do it my way. And if you choose to reject me, then you're inviting into this world brokenness that I never intended to be a part of this reality. And that's, in fact, the story of the Bible. Yeah. When you read Genesis and you see that it was mankind's in rejection of God that literally broke the cosmos. It literally unraveled creation. It created death where there was no death. It created disease where there was no disease. Genesis says the weeds start growing in the gardens. There'd never been weeds before. All of a sudden, Adam and Eve are toiling in their labor. They'd never toiled before. Hardship comes into the world as a result of our rejection of God. And that happens in the first three chapters. And the rest of Scripture, the whole thing from Genesis straight to Revelation, is God actually undoing the curse that we brought into the world. And that's the good news. He really has undone it. He's done it and he's undone it in Jesus Christ. The whole story of Scripture is the big picture plan of redemption. God, and that's what that word means, redemption, literally purchasing back a, a world of rebels from the disease and stain of death that we brought in for our own rejection of God. Mm -hmm. So God, you know, he's not, he's not, the, he's not the bad guy. Um, he's, he's the good guy. He, yeah. that, that's why we call him Savior. And Amen. this is what I tell people is, look, when you get in a situation where you're living into the realities of this present darkness, and that's, that's where, we, where we live. We live in a world that's broken and there is darkness. You need to always and every time assume that God is good. Like, what if you looked at your circumstances assuming that God was good? Like, okay, this just happened to me. Let me just assume that God is good and see if that changes the way I'm looking at this reality. Like, okay, God, if you're good, I'm just going to assume that you are. Help me understand why this is going on and what I should do with it. Um, you start with that reality, you're going to find God in that place. You absolutely are. Yeah. That's a good answer. Thank you. More to be said about that. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions, any comments? You can say anything in the uh, taglines. We all have to rely on God right now through this health crisis. It's true. So many different areas. Of yeah, life. we do, and we got to rely on God one day at a time. You know, I would encourage yeah. you to go back and listen to the message from last Sunday at church. God wants you to trust Him one day at a time. Yeah. 
Mark and Patricia just joined us. Nice. So, all right, any more questions? We got a couple more. We're gonna end with one, I think a really good fitting one at the end of this time. So, uh, well, why don't we end with this one? See how it goes. And then if you have any questions with it, uh, does my life really matter to God? So if God exists, which we believe he does, um, do I matter to him? Do yeah. these little situations in my life <clears throat> and going through what matters? How does it matter? Dang, Seth. Yeah. <laughs> does my life really matter, matter to God? You know, um, all right, let's get, we'll get philosophical here for a second. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> every decision that we make and every thought that we have um, is really built upon our view of ourselves, our world, and our God. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of research and philosophical thought out there on the idea of a worldview. And a worldview is this. A worldview is the lens through which you interpret everything that happens to you. It's like a pair of glasses that you put on. It's the lens through which you see. It's the filter with which you understand everything that happens to you. And every faith system, every religious system, every culture, every person has a worldview. And the worldview helps you answer questions like, who am I? Why am I here? What is life about? Who is God? What is he like? Um, those are actually worldview questions. And let me tell you one of the things that our culture has done is we have, through a humanistic worldview that starts with us and not God, we have taught ourselves, not overtly, we don't just go right after it and tell people this overtly, but everything we do sometimes insinuates this, that you are a product of circumstances out of your control and out of others' control. You're a victim. You're a result of time and chance. Um, let me just think about even an evolutionarily evolutionary worldview. And one of the reasons why I have a big problem with an evolutionary worldview humanity is because it's in diametric opposition to the biblical worldview, which says this, you are not the result of time and chance. You are not a microbial accident that started in a soup billions of years ago that turned into apes and then eventually became a human. You are created in the image of an invisible God. And that God knows everything about you. Every one of the days of your life was written in his book before one of them came to being. You're not an accident. You're not a victim of chance and time. Um, you are a, a fully beloved son or daughter of the Most High God who is made in him, his image and whose whole life exists for relationship with him. Amen. And if that's the way you approach things, it changes everything about your life. Um, and so, Dan, so, you know, you're asking a question like, does God care about me? Uh, yes, he cares about you. Um, does he know who I am? Yes. Does he understand what I'm going through? Yes, he does. Your whole, your, the reason you are here, whoever yeah. you are, um, Seth, the reason you're here, the reason I'm here, it's not, it's not to get stuff done. It's not to be productive. Um, it's not to be successful. It is to know God, yeah. to walk with Him, and have a relationship with Him. And you know, um, that's oftentimes not the way our culture defines ourselves. I mean, mm -hmm. in our 21st century reality, um, we are always evaluated and defined by what we produce. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes when someone asks a question like, well, do, does God love me? Does he care about me? Uh, why am I here? What is life about? Um, they're asking that question from the assumption that they've got to get stuff done, make it happen, be successful the way the world says you should be successful um, in order to make their life count. And that's a ridiculous lie that our culture's propagated against us. And it's not the biblical view of things. So Holy Scripture says this, that your life counts because you're made in the image of a God who counts. Your life has meaning because it's meant to exist in a relationship with God. You're, you're not the sum of your products you produce. Um, you don't count more if you have a good job. You don't count more if you get a better grade on a test. You don't count more if you're smarter, if you have a higher, higher aptitude, if you're better looking, whatever that means. I mean, even think about that when we evaluate ourselves that way, like, I'm not good looking. Who says? Who said that to you? Um, you know, you said that to you. You're, you're evaluating, your, you look in the mirror and you're evaluating yourself based on what the TV tells you 
should bring you worth and value. Well, hold on a second. That, that's a worldview question that you've just answered. Um, that's a worldview assumption. Why don't you go to the scripture? Um, the scriptures are so clear. No matter what you look like, you are beautifully and wonderfully made. You got incredible value, and you need to stop believing the lies. And I'm, you know, there there are so many ways that the world, the flesh, and the devil lies to us, and we believe it. And I believe it. Um, so we need each other. Yeah. We need each other to tell each other the truth to encourage one another as long as today is called today, to push our, ourselves collectively towards a holy God who doesn't, and that, remember what holiness means, he doesn't think like we think, he doesn't act like we act, he doesn't, he doesn't, um, he doesn't think about you the way you think about yourself, he doesn't think about your world the way you think about your world, and he's inviting you into that, he's inviting you into his otherness. That's what holiness is. Holiness is not churchy goodness. Yeah. It's not about uh, avoiding fun things and praying more and singing old hymns um, holiness is an invitation into the total otherness of God and that is always better than what we come up with ourselves Amen. preach Amen. it now yeah and that's a God who exists and I'm thankful he, he's God and I'm not because he's so other I'm also thankful so, you are not God I am also thankful for Tom so everyone say thank you Tom for uh, in this, and uh, Thanks, we got Dad. anybody got any more questions? Um, They're coming. Hey, ha, ha. Lauren, uh, we today. can do some announcements at the end. And uh, <clears throat> so, Lauren posted, How is everyone's Mark readings? So, comment, encourage each other. Hey, I love and, uh, Mark, bring me into that. Yeah, Mark's my favorite gospel because it's found, sir. Well, it's because it, yeah, sure. Okay, really? let's yeah. riff on Mark. Um, well, first of all, it's short. 16 chapters yeah so it's like the add gospel yeah short and sweet get it done before you get distracted by something else yeah but let me tell you why it's also my favorite gospel um each one of the gospels matthew mark luke and john it's here's my title for the gospels um one story four perspectives it's the same jesus in all four gospels but it's a different angle on who jesus is matthew's writing to describe jesus as the fulfillment of the old testament he is the savior of the jews he's the messiah the Messiah that the Old Testament looks towards. He's doing that because he's writing to a predominantly Jewish audience. Mm -hmm. John's writing to a group that's questioning whether Jesus is God. So John packs all these stories into his gospel that show very clearly that Jesus is God, fully God. Um, he's doing that because his audience was unsure in that area. Well, Mark is writing to a suffering church. Yeah. Mark's writing to a church that's been unraveled by the first persecution in the Roman Empire a persecution under Nero after the burning of Rome in 64 AD Nero brings the hammer down on the Christians and starts wholesale persecuting them I mean people are getting thrown to the arena um, people are getting sewn up in animal skins people are getting covered in wax and lit on fire for pagan parties yeah. I mean and these are Christians it was a really tough time to be a Christian in the New Testament and so Mark just puts a 16 chapter gospel together showing us this that Jesus is well acquainted with our sufferings yeah that Jesus himself is the suffering serving Messiah God that he empties himself taking the form of a slave being born in human likeness suffering to death even death on a cross that's what Paul tells us in Philippians mm -hmm. and that's the tone of the gospel of mark it's just story after story after story of Jesus just offering himself over to a world who doesn't understand who he is it's an incredible encouragement to Christians who are suffering too. So yeah. with that, I think that's a pretty yeah. good book to be studying right now. Yeah, and that's why we chose it, just because we can relate to anything we're going through, and that's what's, what's happened. So still be encouraged, encourage each other, text each other, remind each other. I know I've had to be reminded too. So, and uh, so wow. And uh, also another announcement on Zoom. Uh, a lot of a lot of boomers a lot of older people are using zoom so we're gonna have a link on the front page of the website um, as you know during the 9 11 o'clock service uh, we have that youth group in the middle at like 10, 10 15. 15 so exactly at 10 15 just like we're by the lake at our youth building with the skylight um, before we get our building permit um, 10 15 you're gonna click on the zoom link and it's gonna bring you straight to kind of like a webinar call. And so it's just not gonna be hearing a bunch of 
uh, bad jokes and really good theology though. But um, it's going to be kind of more interactive. I like, heard. well, we have Those some. Awesome. We're old. We're like, um, you know, we, our jokes are just hey, not as I funny. I think as I look pretty good for forty. Yeah, you're. you're Right. Okay. Everybody add your comments below. Yeah, put comments below. <coughs> Amazing. Amazing. So a Zoom link at ten fifteen. So let's let's pretend uh, and just go straight and pretend we're at the lake again. You know, I yeah. could actually even be at the. You link. get that on so, the website. On the website, the Zoom link, and then you can download the app. So students, same thing. Ten fifteen. You can watch the nine o'clock service. We'll discuss the sermon. We'll talk, and I'm curious to see how you guys are doing. And um. Yeah, if you guys need anything, email, uh, whatever. And then also one thing, talk to your parents. Uh, I can also arrange keeping the church unlocked. If you do keep your inductive Bible study journaling Bible at the church, I could. I don't. I won't even have to be there. I'll just keep the church unlocked. You can go get your inductive Bible study Bible if you did not get a chance to get it before everything went on lockdown. But no sneaking out of the house to go get your Bible. Don't do that. Don't go against your parents. Do whatever it takes to get your Bible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the pastor kidding. permits wow. you to coerce your parents to going and getting your Bible. Your pastor's as quickly as possible. So sarcastic and you're getting this fired. I'm sorry, Mitchell. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. Thank you so much. We love you guys. Be encouraged. I hope tonight encouraged you. This will also be on YouTube. See so you Sunday. You see you Sunday. Uh, on Facebook. We're not rebelling. We're not breaking the... Psalm 23, the Good Shepherd. Yes, we're not breaking the dice. And you're a little closer Facebook. than six feet right now. I need you to lean that I'm way. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Tom. There we I'm go. Gonna, Bye, you better everybody. go jump in the coin pool. See you. Thank you, everyone, for being here.